Hello everyone, this is Dr. Zachary Lau. Today I'm here to talk to you about the MMC queuing model. And this is part of lecture 7 of CB2201 Operations Management. Alright, so uh, this is a section of that lecture. Uh, we'll be talking about queuing models and how you can use them to help you to decide the optimal service quant capacity. Let's make this more concrete. Suppose you're the manager of a Starbucks coffee store. You need to make the decision about how many employees you plan to schedule. If you have too few staff, customers will have to wait a long time for the coffee. And customers without coffee are angry. If, on the other hand, you have too many staff, this will result in high salary expenses. So, as a manager, you need to think about how do you strike the right balance between the customer waiting times and the salary costs for your company. While you could try to make a scheduling decision using your gut feel or your experience, the companies Smart companies use the scientific method to help them to uh, make the right decision. So, we'll, we'll be discussing today something called queuing theory, which is a branch of mathematics where people study waiting lines or queues. In particular, we'll be talking about the so-called MMC queue, which is a simple model of a queuing system. In case you're wondering why it's called an MMCQ, basically in the first M refers to memoryless inter-arrival times, the second M refers to memoryless service times, and the C refers to the number of servers. Here's how things work in a queuing model. For, uh, when a customer arrives, he checks if the queue, the servers are busy. If the servers are busy, there's no free server, then the customer will join the queue and wait until his turn. The server will start to serve the customer, uh, the next customer in line whenever the server is free. And when the customer service is completed, the customer will depart and leave the system. So in a queue, there are two, there's customers and there are servers who give service to the customers and customers may have to wait in the queue to receive service. Here, uh, the queuing model can be used to analyze many different real-life situations. Here's a simple, uh, for example, if the system is a bank, then customers might be queuing to see, to use the ATM. or if it, the system is the city health clinic, custom patients might be waiting to see their general practitioner. So in an MMC queue, we have the following input parameters. The arrival rate, which is denoted by lambda, is defined as the number of customers arriving per unit time. For example, four customers arrive every minute on average. The second parameter is the service rate, which is denoted by mu. And this is defined as the number of customers that a single server, note the emphasis here, can serve per unit time. Sometimes you might need to do a bit of calculations to get the service rate. For example, if it takes on average 10 minutes to serve a customer, then a server can, probably can serve 6 customers in an hour. Finally, the last parameter is the number of servers, which is denoted by C. And in a queuing model, we usually assume that one server can only serve one customer at a time. In case you're wondering what are these strange letters lambda and mu, which you may not have seen before, these are actually letters from the Greek alphabet. And that's why they look a little bit strange to us if we don't know Greek. In mathematics, Greek letters are often used to denote variables. Uh, so if you're not, you know, if you 
find that a bit strange, well, get used to it. Alright, this is a diagram of the MMC queuing model showing the arrivals, the arrival rate lambda, customers arriving and joining the queue, and we have C different servers, each server with a service rate of mu, and the because there's a single queue, a cu waiting customer will join, will receive service from, you know, um, from whichever server becomes free. Now, you might wonder if the MMC model is accurate, uh, and in reality, it is not 100% accurate, but it's still quite useful. Uh, George Box is a famous statistician who, is, who said, essentially, all models are wrong, but some are useful. And for example, uh, if you think about uh, queuing to see a bank teller, most banks have basically one queue for everyone, a common queue for everyone. So in this case, it, the bank operates very much like an MMC queue. On the other hand, if you're waiting to pay for groceries at the supermarket, you might find one queue per cashier. So an MMC queue is not such a good representation of how queuing works at the supermarket. Nevertheless, we're going to just use the MMC model because we want to keep things simple in this course. And even though it's not 100% accurate, it gives predictions that are fairly accurate and are fairly useful. In terms of the output parameters that we want to calculate, we want to calculate the average queue length, the average waiting time, and the average total time in process. I would now like to introduce a useful math result called Little's Law. It's called Little's Law because it's named after a person called John Little, who is a professor from MIT, which is my alma mater, where I got my PhD. Yeah. Anyhow, Little's Law states that L is equal to lambda W. Remember, L is the average Q length. Lambda is the average arrival rate and W is the average waiting time. For example, CB, let's look at an example of how Little's Law can be useful. Let's say the College of Business admits 800 students per year, and that on average, a student takes four years to graduate. Then the number of students, L, in CTU on average would be four years times 800 students per year, which is 3,200 students. All right, so when do customers have to wait in the queuing model? Let's first look at, compare the arrival rates with the system service rate. So the arrival rate lambda and the system service rate C times mu. Each server can serve new customers per unit time, and we have C of them, so that's why we have to multiply it. In the first case, if the arrival rate is greater than the system service rate, the queue is unstable and will grow to infinity and beyond. Hey, Buzz. In the second case, the arrival rate is less than C times mu, then it depends whether there's variability in the inter-arrival and service time. We'll discuss this in the next slide. Of course, it's technically possible that lambda is equal to C mu exactly, but basically this is very unlikely to happen, and let's just forget about this situation. Do not make things confusing. Well, whether customers need to wait depends on whether there's variability as well. So if the uh, if there's no variability in inter-arrival and service times, you'll see later that there's no queuing and no waiting. But if there is variability, then due to randomness, some customers may have to wait. Another thing, important thing to know is that, in general, if you increase the variability in the inter-arrival and service times, the 
average waiting time will also tend to increase. All right, let's go back to case 2a where there's zero variability in the arrivals and services. Suppose a customer arrives exactly every 10 minutes and every customer takes exactly 8 minutes to be served. So you see that there's no waiting. The customer 1 arrives at time 0, is served for 8 minutes, then the server has 2 minutes of free time to check his Instagram or post on Snapchat before the next customer arrives and he, the server is busy for 8 minutes, then there's 2 more minutes of free time and so on. Let's now look at case 2b where there is variability. So customers arrive on average every 10 minutes and every customer takes on average 8 minutes to receive service but there's randomness. So some customers take longer to receive service, some are shorter, some cus sometimes customers will arrive very rapidly, sometimes for a long time no one will arrive. So in this case, uh, customer 1 arrives and at time 0 only needs a bit of service. Customer 2 arrives a bit later than average and requires a very long service. And customer 3 arrives very quickly. So customer 3 ends up having to wait about 10 minutes. So all of this waiting comes from the variability. If we reduce the variability, then we'll get something like the previous case. Uh, as the variability goes, is small and smaller, you have basically no variability and basically no waiting. So, uh, in this course, one of the materials we'll be using is the average queue length table. And if you click this link, you'll see it on my Google Drive. It looks something like this. Uh, basically, the rows correspond to lambda divided by mu, the arrival rate divided by the service rate, while the columns correspond to the number of servers C. Um, so there are three co different colors in the table. In the top right-hand triangle, the queue length is almost zero, or basically it's zero, because we have a lot of servers relative to the arrival rate of customers. In the bottom left-hand side a triangle, the queue length is basically infinite because we just don't have enough servers. So the arrival rate is greater than the system service rate. In the middle region, um, somebody worked hard to do the calculations to show you what is the expected or average queue length in this model. Note that you don't have to memorize this table. We'll give it you a copy whenever you go for the quiz or exam. So relax. So if you look at the table you might realize, and draw a plot, you might realize that the service capacity has a non-linear non effect on the queue length or the waiting time. Let's look at an example. Um, let's say you have eight. Uh, this is an example where lambda over mu is 7.8. And let's say you increase from 8 to 9 servers. So the service capacity increases by 12.5%. At the same time, the wait time decreases very drastically by 89, almost 90%. So what you see is that small changes in the capacity, can, service capacity, can have a very large impact on the average waiting time. The next thing that you should realize from the table is that there are three ways to reduce the queue length and the wait times. The first method is to reduce the service time, which is the same as increasing the service rate mu. So basically when you do that, the system will move up towards the top. The second way to reduce the queue length, of course, is to increase the number of servers or increase the service capacity. Finally, you can also decrease the variability in the interarrival or service times. Uh, but that can't really be shown in this table because uh, the kind of 
the variability is hard-coded by the memoryless assumption. If you don't understand what I said, don't worry about it. It's just some math stuff, not very interesting and not very useful. Okay, so how can you calculate the output metrics of interest? These are the three steps you need to follow. You need to calculate lambda divided by mu. In the next step, you can read the table to find the average Q length L. And then finally, you can calculate the average weight time W using Little's law. Okay, this might sound a bit abstract, so let's go through an example to make it clear. Suppose we want to use an MMC queuing model for the taste supermarket. And we have the following observations that 780 customers arrive every hour. And on average, a cashier requires 36 seconds to serve a customer. And just so happens that taste employs eight cashiers. So let's try to calculate the key output metrics that we care about. A good place to start is to have this table, which basically contains all the parameters or the outputs that you need. Um, we can copy from the previous slide the arrival rates and the number of servers. But the other quantities are unfortunately not immediately known. So the first step is to calculate the service rate. Since it takes 36 seconds to serve a customer and there are 3,600 seconds in an hour, we can calculate that it takes that you can serve 100 customers in an, a server can serve 100 customers in an hour. I suggest when you do the division that you write down the units because it will help you to verify that you're dividing the correct thing by you know, correctly. So A divided by B and not B divided by A because the units will be wrong if you do the wrong division. Okay, so now that we've got the service rates, we can fill in the table, mu, and lambda divided by mu. The next step is to calculate L. So first we find the row, 7.8, then we find the column, C equals 8, and this gives us the L that we want, which is 35.9. We just copy and paste that in the table, very good. The next step is to calculate W using the formula. So just plug it in the average Q length and the arrival rate and convert the quantity from hours into minutes. So that's another place where the units are important. Finally, you can calculate the average total time process by just adding the average wait time to the average service time. After you've done this, we've filled up the table, and that's great. All right, so that's all about the MMC queuing model. Let's look at some of the key takeaways. So the MMC model is not a 100% accurate uh, representation of most real-world systems, but it does give useful predictions that are approximately correct. We saw in the graph that service capacity has a nonlinear effect on the queue length and the wait times. We also found, uh, discussed the three ways to reduce waiting times, which are... Oops, I forgot. But anyway, you can review your slides or review the video to find out if you forgot. So, no, so I don't have to repeat myself. Great. All right, that's all for now. Thanks for watching this video. See you again soon. Bye.